Shalom, everyone, and welcome to this Rise on Fire broadcast. Um, I'm excited today because I'm joined by a special guest who I'm about to introduce to you. And we're going to be talking about an incredibly important topic. Uh, just recently, a video was released by a ministry called Christian Truthers. And this video they released was titled 50 Reasons to Never Quote Paul Again. And in this video, uh, the teacher went along to give 50 reasons why Paul is a false apostle and why we ought to treat him that way, not to read him, not to consider his words. And as you may imagine, this is a very important topic. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in that video of why it is so important, because many don't think it is. Many think Paul's writings are mere opinions or uh, because Paul is not our savior, it's not a big deal if we get rid of his writings. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're also very importantly going to be going through each and every, well, most of these points, the most critical ones, um, uh, these reasons that were given for why he is a false apostle. And so we are going to be taking the position, of course, that he is not a false apostle. He is a true apostle commissioned by God to us to write the writings he did to leave, um, which we have in our New Testament today. And so today I am I would like to introduce to all of you uh, my guest, David Wilbur, who is joining me on this uh, program today. David, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hey, Shalom, everyone. It's great to join you, PD. It's, it's an honor to be with you. Awesome. I, and I just want to tell you guys a little bit about David. Um, David is an author of multiple books. He's an incredible author. He's a very um, well-spoken and wise teacher regarding uh, the scriptures. He has a, a recent book he put out called, Is God a Misogynist? Understanding the Bible's Difficult Passages Concerning Women. Um, he's uh, he also spoke, speaks at churches and conferences throughout the United States, and he currently serves on the teaching staff at 119 Ministries. That's possibly where many of you have seen David before. And so, David, I think one of the um, first things that I, we want to talk about is just the, the context of this video. And, and it's really, uh, what I want to just say with regards to that is, is many people who are going to be watching this, I know, are uh, viewers of the Christian Truthers um, a ministry. And I want to just say that this is not an attack on, on that ministry. Um, we are not here because we have fun um, talking about a ministry in that way. We are simply here out of necessity. Um, we need to understand that um, when we listen to a ministry, right? If, if you have a favorite minister, a, a teacher, you're going to grow an emotional attachment to that minister. And that's going to be expected. However, we need to always test what is being taught, even by the people we trust. And so if someone who we trust teaches something contrary to the word of God, we need to be willing to accept the fact that if they're teaching falsehood, that it is falsehood, even if we like them, because otherwise we will be idolizing a teacher. And so I think that's very important um, as we head into this for everyone. Let's not make this about a ministry versus another. It's not about me or David or Justin. Um, this is about the word of God and what is true and what is not. Um, and I also just want to say also that uh, I have personally reached out to Justin before uh, we made this uh, even uh, a week ago or so, and uh, because I, I wanted to have a personal discussion, he has not responded to various emails, and so this is why we have been forced to do this kind of response for the protection of the body of Christ um, against these teachings, which we believe can be dangerous. Um, so, David, uh, what do you think rega with regards to the idea of removing Paul? from the scriptures. What is the big danger that you see can come in due to that? So this is uh, incredibly dangerous false doctrine. And um, 
And when I saw this video being shared on, on social media, um, you know, by people, and I, I started reading some of the comments uh, in the, the comment section of people that were being persuaded by this video, uh, my heart was just deeply grieved because uh, I've seen this before. I've, I've seen people that have been hoodwinked by counter missionaries, uh, you know, into doubting the New Testament. And it usually starts with Paul. And uh, then it goes to doubting the Gospels and then eventually rejecting Yeshua the Messiah. Now, Justin says that he hasn't done that yet. You know, he says that he'll never um, reject Yeshua the Messiah. And I'm, I'm thankful that he hasn't. Uh, but that is only because he is being logically inconsistent in his mm -hmm. position. Um, he is being logically inconsistent because the logical implication of rejecting Paul is that you will end up rejecting uh, the rest of the New Testament. Rejecting Paul comes with rejecting Luke and Acts. It comes with rejecting Second Peter. It comes with rejecting James because James vouched for Paul, right? All the other apostles in, in the, uh, the New Testament. And then it just snowballs from there. So that's one reason. Another reason uh, why this is so important is that it, it's a matter of throwing out the words of God. I mean, it, it's not a matter of just throwing out letters written by some, you know, uh, first century Jew. These are the words of God. Yeshua said that the Holy Spirit would guide his people into all truth, that he would send the Holy Spirit, that they would guide his people into all truth. And uh, Paul, like the other apostles and their close companions, like Mark, Luke, and James, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the words that they wrote. Paul wrote the words that he wrote to guide us into God's truth by the Holy Spirit. So when we declare that Paul is a false prophet, when we declare that his words that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write are not from God, that, that they're, uh, you know, you know, false doctrine, we're not disparaging just Paul's writings. We are disparaging the Holy Spirit who inspired those writings. So this is a very serious issue. And uh, I just, uh, I don't have anything against Justin as a person. Um, you know, I, my heart is that he will repent and um, that he'll come to his senses and that those who have been deceived by this false doctrine, that they'll come to their senses uh, because this is a big deal. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I just want to also uh, read here uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. And if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. And that's, of course, we need to know if, if he is indeed a true apostle as we are taking the position of then that is has dark consequences for anyone who rejects him as a mm -hmm. true apostle because he says what i'm writing to you is a command of the lord and you know i know some people might think well how can he say that because you know uh he some people think he goes against the law of god but you see if you think that then that's where the errors start because paul contrary to how many have taught isn't full um, agreement with the Torah, the front of our book, um, the prophets and everything. He's never writing against the law of God. He is actually an expert on it. And um, mm -hmm. he just educates his, uh, his, uh, his readers on the deep things of the word of God. And some will not understand it unless they really get uh, a lot of knowledge first on what the word of God says in terms of the Torah, the prophets and, you know, etc. And that's what Peter and to Peter, we read that um, Paul is hard to understand, right? And so one of the greatest ways, I think this, we need, all who listen, we need to understand one of the greatest ways of rejecting the Messiah um, or, or, or parts of him is to reject his words and to not do them. So if Paul is educating mm -hmm. us on how to be a good disciple of the Messiah, because that's what he, I believe he's trying to do, but we reject the, his commandments, his, the principles he's giving us and teaching us. 
we are rejecting part of the walk of our Messiah. And that is dire. That's a big problem. And that means that we will not be able to bear the fruit that we would have been bearing if we actually believed um, Paul was uh, legit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, God chose to, to write through pe people like Paul. And that's how he preferred to do it. Uh, Yeshua, Jesus, he didn't write his own book. He, God preferred to have other men write about him because that makes the testimony of um, Yeshua even stronger. So with that all being mm -hmm. said, uh, let's jump into this list. Um, I just want to say a few things about this list. There are 50 of these um, points that we're about to dig into here. And just because I just want to also say, just because there are 40 of the uh, 50 of these reasons, it doesn't mean it's more convincing. Um, I think one of the goals of making it such a big list is is making it think that it make, makes it more credible than a shorter list. Okay, as mm -hmm. we will soon discover, not one of these points are even strong remotely. Um, I also want to say that some of these points are going to be repeated. So uh, Justin repeated. Uh, rephrase some of the points in some ways. And so because of that, we're not always going to address every single one of the 50 points. But we did just, um, excuse me, David, however, did address each and every one of these points in his article, which we will be linking in the description of this video for everyone to go and look at if there is something they're wondering about. But we will be discussing all the big ones, like I mentioned. Um, so yeah, and with that, we're also going to be going pretty quick because there's a lot to go through. So bear with us, brothers and sisters, and thank you for joining us. So um, I'm going to read the first one for us. Uh, the first point is Paul's testimony of his conversion is inconsistent at best and has a very close resemblance to the conversion of Joseph Smith and Muhammad. Yeah, so... I, this is a uh, bizarre objection to bring against Paul because if your um, reason for rejecting Paul is that there are some apparent inconsistencies in part of his conversion story um, or apparent con inconsistencies elsewhere, uh, you not only would have to throw out Paul, but you'd pretty much have to throw out every book in the Bible. So say goodbye to the Gospels, time to throw out First and Second Kings because of the apparent inconsistencies with first and second chronicles um exodus and deuteronomy uh deuteronomy repeats a lot of the information in exodus and there are apparent inconsistencies in between them so uh, if this is your logic for rejecting paul then you know you'd have to throw out other books in the bible even books of the torah so it, it's really not a very good objection against paul there are apparent inconsistencies and even apparent contradictions all over the Bible. It's our duty as uh, followers of students of the word to find possibilities for harmonization. Uh, you know, the, the fact that there is an apparent inconsistency, that's not a problem with the scriptures, that is a problem with us and our limited understanding. But when we wrestle with the scriptures, when we study, we can find um, uh, resolution, we can find harmonization in the scriptures if we do the work to to study it. And uh, the point about um, the, you know, Paul's, uh, uh, and by the way, there, there are a ton of resources, uh, and I linked a couple in my article, there's a ton of resources that do resolve the apparent inconsistencies in Paul's conversion story, if you're interested. The, the point about uh, the um, you know, Paul's conversion story being similar to Joseph Smith and uh, Muhammad, that's really just another bizarre uh, point. It's the definition of a false analogy fallacy. For instance, uh, Paul, he didn't create his own religion. He, um, he, he converted to the messianic sect of Judaism that was already in existence that was started and founded on Messiah and his teachings. So um, it's really, there's no comparison. And, and besides, and, and if you're going to say that uh, the fact that there are maybe some similarities between Muhammad and Joseph Smith and Paul, um, did it ever occur to Justin that 
Muhammad, the, the story of Muhammad and Joseph Smith came way after Paul. So if there was any copying going on, it's Islam and Mormonism that copied Christianity. So there's, you know, it, it's just, it's just a bizarre point uh, and certainly not a reason to reject Paul. Yes, and I also want to add, I don't actually th uh, think the, the, because he mentioned Acts 22 and Acts 9, um, th those two is inconsistent. And I just want to show that there is no real inconsistency here with regards to that. Um, I just want to read first verse 9, Acts 22. Now, now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. Okay, that's the first one. So those who were with him saw the light, but they couldn't understand the voice. And then in Acts 9, verse 7, it says, The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Now, just to mention that there is, they are inconsistent, these two accounts, but they aren't. Um, the one says he saw the light. Okay, the second one says they didn't see anyone. That means they didn't see a person. That... Well, they saw a light. They didn't see anyone. They just saw a light. So that's consistent. And in, in, in terms of the hearing, they, it's, they, um, the first account says they couldn't understand the voice. And the second account says they heard a voice. So, yes, they, they couldn't understand the voice, but they heard a voice. They didn't see a person. They saw a light. So mm -hmm. there's no inconsistency with these two scriptures. It's not that hard to see if we just really think about what it says. And also, I just want to mention that Paul's testimony is actually more reason to prove that he is a true apostle mm -hmm. than reason that he's not. Because he is this great persecutor of the church before his conversion. He is probably mm -hmm. the biggest. And he hates these people that we, we know as the disciples. He hates their apparent Messiah. And now suddenly, over, almost overnight, he completely takes a 180 turn. And he is now one of the greatest runners for Messiah. Um, that's crazy. That's, we have to ask the question, who would do that unless he had an encounter, a true encounter with God? No one. No one. Um, and amen. so, yeah, I mean, so um, we're going to go into the next one here. Um, and it is that Paul changed his own name. The Most High did not David, I know you want to do this one, so I'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just I'm I'm just unclear on how this is an argument against Paul uh, to begin with. I mean, what's what's the problem with even if he did change his name, which I don't think he did. He just he went by Paul, uh, you know, because that was his Greek name, and then Saul was his Hebrew name, and so he even refer uh, continues to refer to himself as Saul after his conversion in, in a couple of instances. So he didn't change his name. He just went by Paul, you know, he was known by Paul to his Greek speaking audience and known by Paul and known by Saul to his uh, Hebrew speaking audience. But um, even if it's true, it, it's not, a, it's a complete non sequitur. You know, that, that would be like saying if like a worship leader, you know, goes by a different name, like a stage name, uh, I have a friend, Chris Frankie. He's a messianic worship leader, and his stage name is Mason Clover. Um, the fact that he goes by, uh, you know, he changed his name, quote unquote. It's not a perfect analogy, but um, you know, he goes by Mason Clover. That doesn't automatically mean that uh, you know his music can't be trusted or anything. It's just a bizarre argument, uh, a, a non sequitur. So, um, anyway, yeah, that's all I got on that. I mean, yeah, I think that's a good argument. Um, I'm going to go into number three. Paul doesn't meet the criteria for apostleship according to the book of Acts. Now, this one was pretty uh, interesting. Justin says that the requirement for an apostle is that he, quote unquote, must have been with the Messiah in person when he was on earth. Now, um, Justin says that this requirement comes from Acts. Um, the first chapter, uh, ch uh, verse 21. And he says that if if someone doesn't physically walk with the Messiah, they can't be an apostle. That's why Paul wasn't because he didn't when Messiah was still on earth. And 
what happened in Acts 1 verse 21 is they're trying to get a replacement, the, the disciples, the apost- the rest of the apostles. They're trying to get a replacement for Judas. And um, and obviously, I'm just going to read it for you guys. It says, so, so one of the men who have o- accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Okay, these one of these men must become, is, is, it doesn't say one of these men are the only men who can be qualified to be, ever be called an apostle. No, the, we need to pick one to be a witness with us of the resurrection. Because these mm. men were all who actually walked with him so they can be a witness that he was raised again in the flesh. Paul could not be that mm. witness because he didn't walk with Messiah before. He only met him afterwards. So that's the criteria. And I want to read on in verse 24. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from Judas turned aside. Okay, so... Again, they're just explaining someone who can be, they're just asking for someone who can be a, a witness to the resurrection. In fact, mm-hmm. um, if that was the, the requirement to be an apostle, then we, we have an issue because apostles weren't just the 12. Um, a, an apostle is actually an office. It's a spiritual office that God has given to his, just like we have teachers, just like there are prophets. Mm-hmm. Just like there's mm-hmm. apostles, just like they're evangelists, okay? It's just another office. It's not abolished and passed away with the 12 were the only ones. No. Okay, so, um, yeah, David, I don't know, if, don't know if you have any other uh, thoughts on that. Oh, uh, no, I, I just, you pretty much covered it perfectly. Uh, you know, the, the title apostle, um, it can mean just the 12 that... Um, you know, that uh, is talked about in Acts, but it also has a broader range of meaning. The semantic range uh, is broader. And we see that, uh, you know, it, it's applied to Barnabas, for example. Luke and Acts applies the, mm-hmm. the title apostle to, to Barnabas. Even Yeshua the, the Messiah is called an apostle in Hebrews 3.1. So the, the name uh, apostle is not limited to just the 12. Um, so to right. deny Paul's apostleship on that basis uh, it isn't taking into consideration the rest of scripture right um for anyone who's listening who'd want just more proof you can go Mm -hmm. have a look at ephesians 4 uh, verse 11 uh, where it's explained how we have different offices and apostles one Mm -hmm. of them okay Mm -hmm. right moving on to the next point this is number four paul claims the title of apostle to the gentiles are all apparently given explicitly to peter Um, Justin claims Peter's vision in Acts 10 is to show Peter he has been sent to the Gentiles. And Paul cannot say he is also an apostle sent to the Gentiles because it's an exclusive um, sent out uh, uh, commission that's been given to Peter. The only problem with this idea is that... um, What Peter's vision did is God had to show Peter that... Peter can eat with Gentiles because there was a massive mm-hmm. uh, problem with that idea in the mind of Peter because the Jew, or the Jewish law of the day in the first century had a prohibition where if a Gentile uh, touched food or or you know it, that food would become unclean or you know you, it would be an unclean act in other words to to eat with a Gentile. So this is why um, uh, uh, God had to show Peter that he can therefore go to, to Gentiles. Um, with this vision that they're not unclean. And yes, Peter did go and he did preach the gospel to Gentiles. He also went later um, to preach it to the Jews, just like Paul mm-hmm. initially was sent and he went to the Jews. And then when they rejected him uh, various times, he got angry at some point and he turned and he went to the Gentiles for a season. Right. The thing is that the gospel is meant for all people right mm-hmm. that's the that's what the gospel is and it's actually an anti-gospel thought to think that the one can only be sent to the one group and the other person is not allowed to go to that same people group um it just is not in line with what messiah um taught us to do so this doesn't really matter i, I it's kind of a it's a weak argument because this is peter was not uh, paul was not against peter's role they both went to various groups at different times Amen. 
Um, I just also want to add, uh, Justin cannot use the Book of Acts here <laughs> because he's trying to use the Book of Acts um, right now to try and prove his point, but he can't consistently still believe that the book of Acts is inspired by God because the book of Acts totally approves of Paul as being a true apostle. Um, yep. And, you know, we have the Jerusalem Council. Um, Acts 15, verse 2, for example, uh, I'm just going to read this, uh, verse 4, rather. When they came to Jerusalem, this is now talking about Paul and Barnabas. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they declared all that God had done for them. So if Paul is false, well, then all of the apostles made a massive mistake and we have to question all of their judgment. And therefore we have to question mm -hmm. all of their writings. We didn't have to question our Messiah himself because he then did a really bad job of picking these people right. who had no discernment apparently, but that's not the case. All the apostles had excellent, way better discernment than Justin, may I say. Um, yes, <laughs> and we ought to trust their judgment. If we threw out just one more thing on Acts, if we threw out Acts, we have to throw out the prophecy of the Messiah where he said that the Holy Spirit will come because in Acts 2, that's yeah. been recorded. So there are many yeah. issues with throwing out the book of Acts alone even. There are many issues. So, brothers and sisters, just think about this. You cannot, like, like David said earlier, you cannot be consistent in your theology and say, I just want to throw out Paul, but not the rest of the New Testament. You, you have to lie to yourself to continue doing that for any good amount of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So uh, point number five, Paul was rejected and sent away from the 12 apostles on multiple occasions. Okay, Justin cites Acts 9 verse 26 to say that the disciples rejected Paul. David, you mm -hmm. want to take this one? Sure, yeah. Um it does say that, but Justin apparently forgot to read the next two verses, which say that they eventually accepted him. And I'm, I'm sorry to laugh. I'm not trying to, you know, poke fun, uh, you know, or belittle Justin. It, it, it's just these these points are so very weak, and uh, the audience needs to understand how bad these arguments are. They they, they just are not good arguments. Uh, but I'm. I'm not trying to belittle him, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's, you know, he, he's sincere. I, I don't doubt his sincerity, but these are just not good arguments. And, and, and I hope that he realizes that and everyone else does. But uh, the next two verses say that they accepted him. Um, the reason they sent him off in verse 30 was to protect him because there were Hellenists, the, the passage says, who were trying to kill him, Hellenist Jews that were trying to exactly. kill him. And then, so, yeah. Yeah, we can move yeah, on. Uh, Justin also said that, um, he also made the point that, be and I'm just going to quote it, uh, I wrote it down. He mm -hmm. said that because Paul is on the chopping block, that is, he's being persecuted so much, more than the disciples, he is suspect. Um, I would actually argue the opposite, that he is because he is persecuted so much, that actually makes a good case that he is a true apostle because Messiah promised persecution. Um, right. It doesn't mean that he is a false apostle. The fact that he wants to, he, he gave up his old life to embrace this life of great persecution is actually, right. like I said, a good testimony. And it's also the promise, yeah. or, or, or let me say, what Messiah said that would happen to him, Paul specifically. Because Messiah, remember when Messiah told Ananias to go and um, go to, to Paul? He said, go to Paul and when Ananias didn't want to do that, he said, go to him. I'm going to show him that he will have to suffer much for my name's sake. So part mm -hmm. of Paul's, one of the first things ever spoken over Paul by the Messiah himself was that he will be persecuted more, probably even more than the rest of the disciples, which was probably the case. So this is actually a point for Paul's being a true apostle, not um, against. All right. Okay. Amen. Cool. So number six, Paul teaches against circumcision and then re deflects when confronted. Okay. Justin cites 1 Corinthians 7 verse 19, in which Paul says that circumcision is nothing to support his belief that Paul taught against circumcision. Okay. Well, there's 
there's a lot to be said about this. Um, David, you can start off. You want to say something? Sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so, you know, this this is a some confusion that a lot of people have, actually, uh, this idea that mm. taught that Paul taught against circumcision. Uh, but that's that's just not the case. And really good scholarship has been done um, in this area. Um, pretty much no Pauline scholar, uh, at least recent Pauline scholar, um, would say that Paul was against circumcision. Um, what Paul opposed was a misuse of circumcision. So in the first century, uh, there were certain sects of Judaism that taught that Gentiles could not be saved, that is, they could not be made part of the people of God unless they became Jewish. And the way that one would become Jewish, a way that a Gentile would become Jewish, is through ritual conversion. And this ritual conversion was a very long process, took about a year, and it included getting circumcised. Uh, so getting circumcised was like the culmination of this conversion process uh, in the first century. And so circumcision kind of became known as a shorthand term to refer to this entire rabbinic conversion process. So, um, so circumcision, therefore, it didn't refer to simply the surgical removal of the foreskin, but it also uh, referred to having a Jewish status in the minds of many first century Jews. And, and that's how the term was used in the same way uncircumcision uh, refers to having a Gentile status. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's much more involved with the terms right. here. So with that in mind, we can understand 1 Corinthians 7, 18 through 19 like this. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? That is Jewish. Let him not seek to remove the marks of his circumcision. That is become a Gentile. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? A Gentile. Let him not seek circumcision to become Jewish. For neither circumcision, being Jewish, counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, being a Gentile, counts for anything, but keeping the commandments of God. So basically what Paul is saying here is that it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. The thing that matters is keeping God's commandments. That's what is important. So he's referring to this ritual conversion in the first century. He's saying Gentiles do not seek to convert to Judaism. You know, uh, you do yeah. not have to do that. Keep, keeping uh, the commandments is what matters. Having a Jewish status as defined by these first century rabbis, that didn't matter. It was nothing, according to uh -huh. Paul. Uh, right. They weren't to focus on that. Um, and, and we know that Paul wasn't against circumcision itself because he circumcised Timothy in Acts 16, 3. And then in Acts 21, 20 through 26, he literally takes a Nazarite vow uh, to prove the false right. accusations against him that he did teach against circumcision. He took a Nazarite vow to show that no, he did not teach against circumcision, but he affirmed circumcision and the, the laws of Moses. So do you have yes. anything more to add on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, David, you explained it really well. I just wanna add also mm -hmm. that the reason that Paul was so, if you read what he said regarding circumcision, the, he, it seems like he was very much against it. Like he, he almost like had a hatred for the ideas surrounding circumcision in his day. And like David mm -hmm. said, th these ideas were not biblical ideas. This was not the biblical teaching about right. circumcision. These were ideas that were um, added laws of men, you can say. And the right. biggest problem with it was that it was actually, for some believed, that circumcision saves you and that the, your, the, the blood yep. of your own circumcision is actually the blood spilled for your um, uh, salvation in essence, instead of the blood of Messiah. So right. as you can imagine, that's very dangerous because you can basically say, oh, we don't need Messiah because we have circumcision. Some believe that. So that's why Paul can yeah. sometimes seem like he, he really doesn't like the idea of circumcision, but he is speaking about the first century perspective of circumcision, right? Not yeah. The he's he's, he's referring yeah yeah he's referring to conversion to, to Judaism. Basically, yes. the these uh, false teachers taught that in order to be saved, you have to convert to Judaism, and you have exactly. to do it our way. Yeah. So exactly. and that so that's what Paul uh, so strongly opposed. 
Exactly. If anyone wants to really dig into this a lot more, uh, we just put out a series in our uh, called the Galatians series where we dig into this idea with the histor historical proof for you guys and you can explore it there. All right. Um, number seven. Okay. Paul calls the actual disciples hypocrites. Okay. Justin has a problem with Paul rebuking Peter in Galatians 2. Okay. So, this story where Paul opposed Peter's hypocrisy. Um, I'm just going to read. So Justin defend, ju defends Peter, stating that Peter did nothing wrong in trying to compel the Gentiles to live like Jews. And Paul sinned for opposing Peter. Okay. And um, Justin also later went and so he, he took this account of Galatians 2 where um, Paul basically is opposing Peter and we're going to talk about that now. And Justin also then said that Acts 11 is the same account of the story and there's that, that's a, an, an act, the story is told completely differently than the way Paul told the story. So therefore, Paul has to be called into question. Well, first off, just in terms of that, um, that's I'm sorry, and I'm trying to really say this with, with the greatest love and respect, but but that's a big oversight because we can very clearly see that Acts 11 and Galatians 2 is talking about two completely different uh, situations. In fact, if we just read, we can read in Galatians 2 verse 11, the one happened in Antioch, and in, in the one in Acts, we can read in Acts 11 verse 11, happened in Caesarea. Okay, these are two different places, and Justin tried to say it's the same event. No, not at all. So, right. Paul didn't... Do, do you want to add anything? Uh, I, I would just say, uh, I mean, you summed it up perfectly. I would just say that if if Justin dismisses Paul on the basis that he, uh, you know, publicly rebuked Peter or whatever, then on that same basis, he would have to rebuke pretty much every prophet in the Bible because every prophet in the Bible rebuked you know, uh, you know, Israel, Yeshua, the Messiah, he rebuked Peter <laughs> too in, uh, in, uh, Mark eight eight thirty three. 33. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's just a bad argument. Right. Um, and the, 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 Justin also tried to argue that the rebuke was wrong because Paul was misguided in his rebuke of Peter, but I want to argue he was not at all. And this scripture right. here was inserted um, for a very good reason to teach us a very good lesson because Peter was being a big hypocrite. Um, there was, right. there were, we need to understand, uh, brothers and sisters, there were many man-made laws and traditions in the uh, first century when we, what we're reading about here. And one of them was, was that um, a, a Jew cannot eat with Gentiles because Gentiles were seen as unclean, like I mentioned quick earlier. And so the problem was that this is why Peter drew back. Okay, Peter was eating with Gentiles, and then we see Jews come in, and suddenly Peter is, suddenly he freaks out a little bit, and he's like, oh, and he, and he withdraws from the Gentiles. Now, the big hypocrisy with that is that for Peter to then, in Peter's mind, for P, by his actions, we can only conclude that Peter would only be able to eat with those Gentiles going forward if they underwent this circumcision conversion process into judaism so that they can become jews so that uh, peter can ultimately eat with them and that's the problem that is actually like we mentioned that's anti-messiah um, anti-messiah uh, idea that the jews had so because it's, it stops the spreading of the gospel to gentiles but it also means that everyone has to undergo this conversion process like david well explained earlier of circumcision and all these things that go along with mm -hmm. that so this is why Peter was hip, a hypocrite um, in, that, in this instance. And this is why Paul did rebuke him. And this is why Paul wraps this up in Galatians uh, 2 verse 16. And he says, Yet we know a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith. The reason he is ending it with that statement is because Paul, um, Peter's behavior was, uh, whether he wanted to or not, promoting the idea that um, that we can be justified by works of the law, things like circumcision, etc. So mm -hmm. it was good for him to be rebuked in that case. Peter made a mistake. Um, Paul also made mistakes in his life, just like every other apostle. So just because someone made a mistake doesn't disqualify them from being a prophet or apostle. Amen. Okay, and uh, number eight. 
uh, we're going to go into number eight now and it says the only source of Paul's confirmation that is in 2 Peter wasn't written by Peter. Justin dismisses Peter's explicit affirmation of Paul's ministry in 2 Peter on the basis that he doesn't think Peter wrote to Peter. David, I'm going to give you this one. Sure. So, yeah, this very convenient way to um, dismiss uh, Peter's affirmation of Paul's ministry here. Um, but, yeah, it, it it's just, well, f number one, it, it's a false assertion to begin with, because that isn't the only source for Paul's um, affirmation among the apostles. We have the entire book of Acts. Um, and uh, also, um, J Justin's reasoning for dismissing Second uh, Peter or, or saying that Second Peter wasn't written by Peter is is just not a, a very good reason. Basically, what he goes on to say is that the style of writing is different between Peter's two epistles. So there's evidence, uh, according to Justin, that they weren't written by the same author. Well, no, they weren't. Um, Peter explicitly says that Silas helped him write his first epistle in 1 Peter 5.12. And uh, exactly. additionally, additionally, Peter could have had other writers help him with his second epistle. And this was a very common thing. Uh, you know, uh, the apostles and people that, that wrote not just scripture, but, but other documents would often have scribes and other people assist them, like editors and, uh, and, and people like that. Uh, that's how scribes basically functioned, uh, whereas like editors and, and would uh, gather together the, the teachings and the traditions and, and, and put them together in writing. So, um, right. yeah, it, it's, you know, and, and regardless of, of, as I mentioned, regardless of the authorship of Second Peter, uh, other places throughout Scripture uh, affirms Paul's ministry. Yes, and um, Justin also actually did quote uh, the, the irony is that Justin quoted Second Peter to try and support his position, even though he believes Second Peter is a, not supposed to be in the Bible. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Um, and uh, I actually think that the quotation, so this is what Justin quoted, um, and this is how Peter wrote regarding Paul, and he, he just told us, hey, Paul is very smart, guys, um, and he is going to, he's like, imagine mm -hmm. for any of us walking into a um, lecture with a PhD surgeon uh, giving some lecture on how to do an operation. If I walk in there, me, I don't know. I know very little about doing an operation, surgery. Um, I'm not going to know anything. I don't know. I wouldn't know what he's saying. Okay. And so, similarly, if we are not taught in the scriptures well, and keep in mind that in, in the first century, the people who were taught well could memorize it by were me memorizing scriptures by the time they were like eight, 12 or something. So they, they, they and, and Paul was no exception. He was, he started, studied on Langamliel, very smart guy. And this is why Peter said, Paul um, is hard to understand, 2 Peter 3 verse 16, and which the ignorant and unstable will twist to their own destruction as I do the other scriptures. And I want to submit that this scripture is speaking about what Justin has done because he is twisting what Peter is saying, excuse me, what Paul is writing to, to really um, bring destruction in terms of ripping it out of the Bible. Um, and we now have to call in question all these other New Testament writings, all the destruction can come from that. And this is what Peter warned us about to look out for, to make sure we know what we're, who we are, uh, uh, know that we, we need to understand the scriptures well before we dig into um, trying to deny who, who Paul, Paul is. Okay, and so now moving on to number nine, Paul calls himself an apostle 20 of the 22 times it's mentioned. The only other time was in 2 Peter, which was not written by Peter, according to Justin, and by Luke, Paul's traveling companion. David, you want to take this one? I mean, I'm... I, I just, uh, the only reason that this point, I mean, there's no reason this, this point makes any sense. But um, as I've explained, as we both explained earlier, the, the logical implications of Justin's position require him to doubt the trustworthiness of Luke and Peter. So this is only a problem if you already doubt, though, if you already doubt the book of Acts, which refers to Paul as an apostle. 
Uh, and if you already doubt Second Peter, which affirms, um, hmm. you know, uh, Paul's Paul's ministry, so it's only a problem if you already approach the, those uh, uh, authors assuming that Paul is a false, false apostle. Right. Number ten, Paul didn't obey the Messiah's Matthew teachings. Okay, Justin states that Paul cursing the high priest after he strikes Paul in Acts chapter twenty-three means that Paul is disqualified from being an apostle because he didn't turn the other cheek as Messiah taught in Matthew 5 verse 48. Well, like I mentioned even earlier, uh, well, that may have not been the best behavior of Paul, but given the situation he was in, it was he was very hard under a lot of pressure. Um, however, if we say, yes, he made a mistake, that does not disqualify him from being an apostle. Right. Okay, that, that does right. not, if, if that's the case, we have to throw out Peter because Peter denied Messiah um, as he was being crucified, you know, and the people were questioning him. Um, there's right. many situations like that, okay? So uh, men aren't perfect. And just because you're an apostle doesn't mean you're suddenly perfect. The only one who was perfect was Messiah. If we could be perfect or if Peter or Paul could be perfect, they could die for our sins. But it is the case right. that they aren't. Um, so th this is a, not a good uh, argument, unfortunately. Right. Um, so moving on to number 11, um, Paul boasted incessantly. Okay, that's what uh, Justin said. And because Paul boasts, he's a, a false apostle. He cites Galatians 1 verse 13, in which Paul talks about his former life in Judaism and how he was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own age among his people. This, according to Justin, is boastful behavior, and thus Paul is a false apostle. Well, yeah, I mean, if you want to call this boasting, fine, whatever, but the reason Paul is even bringing this up is uh, that he wanted to explain his credentials and experience in order to speak to the issues that the Church of Galatia uh, was dealing with. False teachers, as we've already discussed, they were infiltrating the Church of Galatia and trying to lead people astray, uh, teaching this false doctrine that salvation is not only by grace through faith, but you have to convert to Judaism and get circumcised to be saved and, and made part of God's people. So Paul, he came from that background. And so the reason he brings it up is that he knew the false teachers' teachings better than they did and could thoroughly address their error as he goes on to do. So this would be similar to like a Muslim cleric explaining his background, saying, I, I rose up into, you know, the... the uh, Islam and the highest levels of leadership in Islam, and it's all false. Here's why. That's that's basically what Paul's doing. He's adding, you know, credibility to his witness, explaining his background. So I really don't see what the problem is. Yeah, that's good. And I just, I just, I would just add mm -hmm. uh, one Corinthians fifteen verse nine. Just what he said himself. Paul said, "For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle." because I persecuted the church of God. He's being you know. pretty honest and humble in that statement. And I, tr I do believe he, he meant it. Um, right. So, okay, moving on to number 12. Paul tried to discredit Peter and shared his grievance with him openly in a letter. And that is Matthew 18 was not followed. Justin complains about Paul rebuking Peter to his face in Galatians 2. Okay, we, we already kind of touched on this um, however I guess we could just say that um, Matthew 18 is when a brother sins against you that's what Messiah taught if if, um, mm -hmm. uh, if someone was going to be doing something evil against me and I find out about it, I'm not going to go and to Facebook and make a YouTube video about him no but if someone who is a public teacher teaches an open um, something that's not true, or if someone in open and the open sins and everyone is a witness thereof, um, that's a mm -hmm. different situation. This is not a that's not a brother sinning against a brother. This is not right. that is um, Matthew 18 is about private errors, private things which we should keep private, resolve privately. But if it's a public thing, we resolve it publicly if we have to. All right, and that's right. What, and, P and Peter's yeah, Peter's error was public. So exactly, which exactly. so it needed it required a public rebuke. Exactly. 
All right, and number 13 is that Paul doesn't turn the other cheek, but cursed his oppressors. We already discussed this in point number 10. So next point, um, Paul had his very own gospel, which he called my gospel. Justin cites that because Paul talks about the gospel as quote unquote, my gospel, he states Paul has a different gospel. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's just a very weak point again uh you know referring to it as as my gospel is is not saying that it's a different message when i prepare a sermon or a message that i'm going to give in front of church um it's my sermon but the sermon is the message of the gospel. It's the message of Messiah. And, and, and uh, that's basically what Paul says. And Paul even says in Galatians 1, 11, that uh, the gospel that he preached is not man's gospel. So when Paul refers to my gospel, he's not saying that it's a different gospel than what the other apostles taught. He's saying that uh, this is my message of the good news of Yeshua in the same way that any of us, when we share our testimonies, if I say, I, I want to share my testimony, it's not a different message. It's still the message of Yeshua saving me from my sins. Mm, that's a good point. And, you know, if we just break down what gospel means, it means good news. And when we, right, right. When we start believing in Messiah, we make it ours. The good news is our good news, right? That's just what right. it is. Paul is literally saying, this is my good news that I'm sharing with the world. Um, there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that statement. He doesn't have a different gospel. He doesn't teach contrary to any other uh, apostle or the Torah itself. Okay, cool. So going into the next one, Paul claims he didn't benefit at all from the other disciples' wisdom. Um, okay. Well, look, uh, in this case, Justin didn't say what he meant by that. So we're just going to say that it's not true. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, unless you want to add anything I, was, I don't know, that I'm missing, David. Well, he, he didn't really elaborate on this point. Uh, if he's referring to Galatians 1, 16 through 17, when he talks about how Paul didn't immediately consult the other apostles after his conversion, I mean, I... I can assume that that's maybe what he's talking about, but if that's the case, then uh, the problem is that Paul later did go and consult them. If you just keep reading, it says that he later does go down to Jerusalem and stays with Peter for 15 days, then he visits James. And uh, so, mm. yeah, it, it's you, we have to read it in context. Right, right. Okay, number 16, Paul claims that he is the one who laid the foundation that others build on. Uh, instead of Christ. Justin cites 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10 in support of this assertion. And I'll just read it for us. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. Um, Justin didn't read the next verse, but I think he should have. Uh, because the next verse says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, which is Yeshua the Messiah. So he is, Paul himself by admission is not saying, I'm laying a different foundation, I'm laying a new foundation, I'm right. laying a foundation opposing the one Messiah laid. He's saying, I am laying the foundation given to me by Messiah. I am laying the same foundation exactly. that he is. He is all of our foundation. So... I don't know if there's anything you want to add there. Very good. No, okay. no. Okay. Good. Number 17, Paul calls himself a quote unquote father contrary to Messiah's teachings. Okay. I just want to read this here as well. Uh, Matthew 23 verse five, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at the feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and Call no man, and then verse 9, Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father. Okay, Paul said, and so this is what Justin is referring to. Messiah said these certain Pharisees he was speaking about were doing all these things to be seen by men. They love the uppermost room of the feast, mm -hmm. etc. So, and he's saying, don't 
don't call those men your father. And the term father there was really used in, in an authoritative way, which in a way that even supersedes the authority of God in some cases. That's how right. highly um, some men love to be exalted. So that's the idea going around that, that Messiah was teaching. And Paul then said, and this is what uh, Justin is now really um, disputing, and 1 Corinthians 4, verse 14, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Uh, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So he's just, what is Paul just saying here? He's just saying, hey, I am admonishing you. I am loving you as children. I am like a father, like a father who loves his children. This is how my love is for you. This is how I um, see you. Okay, he's not trying right. to say submit to me. Um, I am that like that f the f kind of fathers that Messiah was talking about. No, he's not talking about. Paul is not trying to exalt himself here. He's just expressing his love to his these disciples. And right. So, yeah, uh, we also have a teaching um, called uh, "Call No Man Your Rabbi." or call no man rabbi, which you guys, anyone mm. who wants to know more can go and listen to. Uh, David, anything you want to add? Um, ju just to kind of reiterate some of what you said, uh, the, the terms rabbi and father, they gained a technical meaning in that community that Yeshua was addressing uh, to basically represent in a, a person of authority who is, can be unquestioned. So that's that's sort of the the technical mm -hmm. meanings that uh, these titles gained in the community that um, Messiah is addressing. So Paul's not using the term father in that same way. In fact, Paul uh, countless times throughout that same in that same chapter in First Corinthians, he p continues to point to a th an authority above him. He says, "Do not exceed that which is written." So he's continually pointing to the scriptures as his authority, not saying that you know he's not not this using the term in the same way that these. Uh, teachers and, and Pharisees in Matthew 23 did where, you know, he's like, I'm unquestioned. I'm, you know, I'm the same level as God myself. I'm perfect. You know, that's, that's not how Paul mm -hmm. used it. And, and you did a great job of explaining uh, what he did mean um, earlier. Hmm. All right, cool. Yeah, perfect. Um, point number 18. Paul was incapable of casting out his demon and was the only apostle with this issue. Okay, Justin cites 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, where Paul refers to a messenger of Satan that was given to him to harass him. Paul pleaded with the Lord about it, but it didn't leave him. Um, Justin says that, quote unquote, the other apostles cast out demons like it was no problem, like it was nothing. That's what Justin said, implying that Paul is a false apostle because he wasn't able to cast out this demon. Um, I just want to say that... Uh, we don't, when, when Paul writes about this issue, we need to look at the context. The, when I, uh, earlier I mentioned how when Paul was called by Messiah, one of the first things that was said to Ananias was that he will be heavily persecuted, right? He will suffer mm -hmm. for my name's sake. And when we read it, the, the previous chapter where just before Paul talks about this thorn in the flesh given to him, he is using this almost the entire chapter of 2 Corinthians 11 uh, to explain his intense persecutions. And he's saying, I was shipwrecked and all these other things that happened to me. I was stoned and, and all these things. Um, many believe that Paul's thorn in the flesh, that Messiah did not take away, even though Paul asked, was this persecution that Messiah said would be there even from the beginning from Paul's call. And so... We to say that it was a demon in terms of a spirit of lust or a spirit of anger or something like that. That's that's not what we see in the scriptures. But if it is a demon, let's just make the let's just go there. Let's just say okay, whatever. Let's just say it is a demon. Um, the problem is is just because we have authority over demons doesn't mean they always leave when they're being cast mm -hmm. out. And there's many reasons why they why that may happen. Um, we have um, the reason where Messiah talked about 
when uh, he, he, he gave the analogy of when a demon is cast out, and this is in Matthew 12, verse 43. When a demon is cast out, it goes into dry places. And if it comes home and, the, and it finds the, the home, that means the host, the person it was cast out of previously, now swept clean. That means there's no Holy Spirit filling. There's nothing that happened in that way. That demon will come back into the home and bring more with him. Okay, so if there's no filling of the Holy Spirit that happens after a demon is cast out, the situation can get worse for that person. Okay, so that can happen. We also have um, the reason of um, unbelief, which we see in Matthew 9, 17, verse 19. Messiah said uh, when the disciples, they, they try to cast out the demon out of this person, the demon wouldn't go. And then Messiah came and just cast out the demon just like that. And then they're like, how did you do that? What happened? What did we do wrong? And he just said, because of your unbelief. Okay. So mm-hmm. by this logic, um, the Peter uh, or the other disciples who tried to cast out demons, but failed at least in one case or also false apostles. But it's not always as, as simple as um, casting out a demon. And there it goes. And it's always going to go. There are many things that can go wrong. Um, and so, Yes. I don't know if you want to add anything, just, uh, David. No, no, that was good. Okay. Um, cool. So point number 19. Paul lied to the Sanhedrin when confronted with allegations of teaching against the law and circumcision. Justin states, Paul lied when questioned by the authorities. I mean, yeah, we we already covered this, I think. Um, you know, Paul didn't teach against circumcision, as we, we talked about earlier. He talked about a misuse of circumcision as a part of this uh, ritual conversion process. Uh, and in fact, mm-hmm. the, the proof of this is in Acts 21, again, where James says, hey, these people have been falsely accusing you of teaching against circumcision. And take a a Nazarite vow, pay for these other people, also taking vows uh, to prove that these accusations are false. And Paul went through with it. So Mm. clearly he didn't teach against circumcision. Yes. Um, And also just to mention the the account of where Paul was being questioned by the authorities, that is the, the Jewish authorities of the day. And Justin said that they, that Paul lied to the authorities because First, he was accused of teaching against the law, and then Paul later um, uh, changed the accusation and said, when he was actually standing in front of everyone, saying, "Oh, it is actually with hope that, with res- in respect to the resurrection, that I am being accused to you today." So I just want to say that this is not Paul lying. Paul did not lie here. Um, if we right. actually read in context what happened here. Um, there is something that we will see. And, and I really, I would ask Justin to please, this, the, many of these errors that were made are because he doesn't read. And anyone, we, when we study the scriptures, we need to read chapter by chapter, all of it. We, cherry picking will cause us to misinterpret. I'm just going to go and show quickly in Acts 21, okay, verse 28. This is the accusation brought against Paul. This is the man who is teaching everyone um, everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and had to follow the holy place. Okay, in verse 34, we read, Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. He could not learn the facts. This is now the, uh, in the courts. They could not learn the facts because of the uproar. He ordered him to be brought into the barracks. So they weren't just, initially there was a, an accusation, but then there were many accusations coming up, so many that they even took Paul out of the court and into the barracks because they couldn't bring any sense to what he's being accused of. And so when Paul is ultimately brought to the stand and he speaks and he says in, in verse uh, chapter 23, verse 6, it is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial, he is not lying. Because what this this accusation was probably one of the many that was shouted out mm-hmm. against him. Okay, so yeah. he's not he's not lying. Okay. And by the way, yeah. the court decided and, and concluded that he is innocent. In chapter twenty three, verse nine, it's written, We find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel 
spoke to him. So Justin, you are mm-hmm. saying in essence that you know better than a court's judgment. And to say that is actually then not following what God told us because when there is a court judgment going on with witnesses and the court decides someone is innocent, and now 2,000 years later you come and say he lied and he's guilty, that's actually breaking the law of God. That is not being good with Father's word. All right. Uh, David, anything you wanted to add? Uh, That was all really great. Um, Yeah, in in fact, I think Paul even, he's praying and and asking like, what is, what are these people's problem with me even earlier? Mm. And I I think what what he's doing is he's, God gave him revelation about the real reason he's being persecuted. And that's what he says. Listen, the real issue I'm here is, is, uh, you know, that that I teach the resurrection. So it's not a lie. It's just, uh, you know, him bringing to the surface the actual problem. And uh, right. yeah, so. That's good. There we go. Yeah. Number 20. Paul repeatedly tries to assure people that he is not lying. <laughs> and that's mm-hmm. why he's a false, a false apostle, apparently. Um, David, what are your thoughts? I mean, Paul is using rhetoric You know, uh, other people in scripture do the same thing. Uh, You know, he's saying, I do not lie. Basically, that's, he's just saying, like, I'm serious about this, Uh, you know, and if it's just such a silly, I'm, I mean, I I don't mean anything personally against Justin, but this is just, uh, wherever he's getting this information, I don't know if he's like coming up with this himself or if he's regurgitating from some other false teacher. But these are just such bad arguments. Um, and yeah. if if he is going to dismiss Paul because of Paul's rhetorical style in his writings, then Justin himself is a uh, false prophet, uh, which I think he is <laughs> right now, according to this teaching that, that he put out. But Justin himself constantly repeatedly reassured us throughout his teaching oh i'm not i'm not rejecting messiah by rejecting this i'm not rejecting the entirety of the new testament don't worry guys it's okay why do you feel the need to keep reassuring us of that why do you need to keep uh, reassure so so we could dismiss him on that same basis it's just not not a good you know to to dismiss paul because yeah Mm. yeah yeah i mean and it's it's not wrong for justin to say um, I like if he feels that, you know, he's not throwing out the New Testament, he's not denying Messiah, right. it's good for him to say that. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. Just exactly. like there's nothing yeah. wrong with Paul saying it. Just like there's nothing wrong with standing before a court exactly. and saying I'm innocent. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good to be honest. Right. Okay. It's not to assert your, to mm-hmm. assert your speaking the truth is not evidence that you're a liar. There has to be more mm-hmm. than that. Okay. Okay. Number 21. Paul tells his followers to imitate him, not the Messiah. Um, well, that's not true. Uh, he said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Okay. He did right. not persuade us away from the Messiah ever. Um, and I think what's important to keep in mind is that the definition of a first century disciple is one that actually completely copies um, their teacher. That's why they did what the disciples of Messiah did. They, tr- they, they had to try and copy, be like him, walk like he did in all ways. Okay, that's what Paul's disciples know. We're gonna. That's what John's disciples knew. We're gonna try and be like John. We're gonna try and be like Paul. We're gonna try and listen to his words, his wisdom, be, do what he did, because he's following the that mirror image of Messiah. That's why he said, "Imitate me as I imitate Christ." There's nothing wrong with that. It's a biblical idea, and um, yeah, not a not a reason for being a false apostle. Amen. Okay, number 22. Paul is not eloquent, but confusing. Yahuwah is not the author of confusion. Oh, this is an important point. David, you want to talk about this? Well, I would just say that the fact that Justin and others have been confused by Paul's teachings does not entail that Paul's teachings are not from God. Um, by the same logic, we would have to throw out pretty much the entire Bible because everyone has been confused by probably every passage of Scripture. Yeshua's parables often mystified the Pharisees. 
Even mm -hmm. Yeshua's own disciples were confused by his teachings sometimes. So if we're going to reject Paul on this basis, then we would have to reject um, the Gospels as well. Uh, but the fact that people were confused, it doesn't mean that Yeshua's parables are not from God. Uh, Peter was confused by the vision that God gave him in Acts 10. That doesn't mean that the vision that God gave him wasn't from God. So, I mean, just logically, there, there are so many ways to, to mm -hmm. demonstrate that, that this uh, argument isn't any good. Mm. And um, I would just uh, add to that as a great explanation. Um, John 6, mm -hmm. verse 60, this is the, the um, verse that David just referred to when he talked about Messiah, oftentimes saying things that were interpreted as being confusing. Um, we read in John 6, 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So you could argue yeah. that Messiah was being irresponsible by that logic, by saying, right. eat, my, uh, eat, my, eat my flesh, drink my blood. That sounds crazy for them because they didn't have the spiritual understanding yet. And but that, that, does that mean he is a false Messiah because of that? No. Um, it's not mm -hmm. our fault if we are um, explaining a very deep um, thing that someone doesn't understand yet because of spiritual immaturity. It is that person who needs to grow in maturity so, to a place where they start understanding. Many of Messiah's parables right. are for that very reason there. They're complicated because those who are spiritually mature, seeking it out, asking Father for revelation, just like we have to do with reading Paul. You have to ask Father, show me what you mean by this. Otherwise, you're not going to understand right. what Paul is saying. And, and, and who did Peter say were the ones that were confused by Paul's writings? Mm. It was the unlearned and the unstable, those who, who, were, who didn't know the rest of the scriptures. So it, just to add to your point, uh, PD, it, it's the... Um, yeah, it's the unlearned and the unstable that get confused. So that's not Paul's fault. It's not Messiah's yes. fault that, that people are confused. So it's, right. it's our fault. Yes. Number 23, Paul contradicts himself repeatedly. Okay. Uh, we agree, disagree with that, of course. Justin didn't make, make examples. So I don't know, David, if you want to add, add anything to that. I don't think Paul no. ever contradicted himself. Okay. Um, right. Number 24, Paul taught to follow your conscience, not the law. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I just I just think of how the Holy Spirit was sent to write the law on our hearts. Jeremiah thirty one thirty one. You know, we have this new covenant. The law will be coming to be will become will be written on our hearts. What does that mean? It means that we have a conscience that's going to tell us this is wrong, PD. You know, uh, David, don't do that. Right? We we're going to have the Holy Spirit convict us. That's what it says in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit was sent to convict the world concerning judgment, sin, righteousness. That is the conscience, right. okay? So um, for some reason, that, um, Justin is against the co idea of having a uh, listening to the conscience. Um, of course, we don't follow our feelings or our own thoughts, but the Holy Spirit does speak to us, and we know that it is Him speaking when it's in alignment with the Word of God, okay? So um, uh, he never, uh, Paul never taught that we should not follow the law, but rather the conscience. Um, Romans 3.31, Paul said himself, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. Okay, he is all right. for it. Right. Yeah, countless times throughout his epistles, uh, he, he refers to the scriptures and he, he commands obedience to the scriptures. So it, it's... Um, it's ridiculous to say that Paul never taught to follow the law. We can quote, you know, many, many examples where he did teach that. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are there are some scriptures like in Romans fourteen where Paul does talk about, you know, do what do what seems right to you um, in regard to, uh, you know, which you know, sacred days and things like that. But read the context of Romans 14. That's dealing with opinions regarding, you know, uh, vegetarian versus carnivore diet, right. whether, you know, whether to eat meat. And and so uh, in fast days, as we learn from, from historical right. context. So he's not talking about actual commands in God. 
uh, of God. He's not saying that you're free to ignore commandments of God and just follow your conscience. He's saying right. follow your conscience in regard to things that are not clearly expressed in God's law. I mean, perfect. Uh, number 25. Paul says the law justifies, then says it doesn't in the next chapter. Okay, um, this is Romans 3 verse 20 and Romans 2 verse 13 that he is referring to. He's saying that this is a contradiction. Um, Romans 3 verse 20, I'm just going to read it for us, says, Therefore by works of the law no flesh shall be declared right before him. And then in Romans 2 verse 13 we read, For not the hearers of the law are righteous in the sight of God, but the doers of the law shall be declared right. Um, this is this is pretty simple. Um, I mean, it, 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 Paul is just saying that, you know, we are safe by faith. We are not mm -hmm. safe by the works of by our works of the law. And then he's just in a different place saying that, but you have to be doing works of the law to be declared right, because your faith has to ultimately lead you um, into that path of righteousness, not stopping your old sins, your old ways. We're going to start being more obedient. We're not going to be perfect, and that we're not we're not going to be saved by the by the law. We're saved by faith, but our faith is going to make us walk more in obedience to Father's instructions. And so that's why he just says, hey, don't, th this what he basically is trying to tell us is, don't think that I'm saying that right. you can just have faith and not do the law and still be declared right. Um, you, we have to be uh, right. clean before Father and in walk in holiness. Okay. Right. He, uh, he doesn't say that doing works of the law justifies you. All right, so now going into number 27. Paul caused confusion and 50,000 Christian denominations. And because he caused confusion, he is a false apostle. Um, well, we kind of already addressed this, I think. So, you know, be, just because he caused confusion does, or, or he's interpreted um, wrongly or because people aren't educated in the scriptures doesn't mean it's his fault. Um, and I want to submit to you that people have made many denominations because they like to pick and choose scriptures that they want and toss out the ones they don't. Um, just like, may I say, just like Justin is right now. Um, if we're going to throw mm -hmm. out the whole of the New Testament or, or a part of the New Testament, that's a new Christian denomination that we're going to have to start making right there again. So it's not Paul's fault. Um, it's people's fault who don't like to be obedient and to follow father's instructions. Mm -hmm. Is anything you want to add, David? No, that's good. Okay, cool. Um, uh, number 28. Paul caused lawlessness among so many, and it is added to him unto this day. Yeah, it, uh, it's it's an attribution error. It, it's the same. It's the same thing that atheists try to say when they're like, "Oh, look at all of the horrible things that uh, Christians have done in history, like the Crusades. Uh, look at you know, look at all these horrible things." Well, it's an attribution error because right. uh, there's nothing in Christ's actual teachings that uh, encourage those actions. They're going against Christ's teachings. So they're trying to blame Christianity or they're trying to blame Christ on the basis of what these these unbiblical things that people mm -hmm. did contrary to his teachings. The same thing with, law, uh, with Paul. Uh, Paul didn't teach lawlessness. The fact that people uh, who claim to follow Paul's teachings, um, that they're lawless, well, that, that says nothing about his teachings. It's an attribution error. It, it's, it, it can't be blamed on him what other people who don't follow his teachings do, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I just would like to add that both me and David, we acknowledge and we understand that, that many have taken Paul's writings and try and use it to make an excuse for why they can walk in certain um, lawlessness uh, or... Mm -hmm. uh, sins basically but that like david said that's not um something we can we can't say that's paul's fault it's it's not his fault exactly um right all right okay so uh next uh, number 29 uh, justin say that paul doesn't pass the prophet test of deuteronomy 13. okay deuteronomy 13 simply says uh, if someone teaches against the law of god he is a false prophet um but Paul never does that, ever. He never, ever, ever, ever does that. But you can easily, if you don't understand um, the 
Torah and prophets to begin with, you can easily think that he is because like we mentioned earlier, like I mentioned, I made the example of a surgeon. If a surgeon, surgeon is going to start, uh, a professor is going to give a lecture on surgery, but I walk in, I can, I'm going to make some conclusions about things he's saying that he never meant. And if I go and try and do a surgery, I'm going to, I may cause someone to get hurt. Okay. Because I don't have the basics down. So mm -hmm. this is the same thing. Is it that professor's fault? No. Okay. It's not. It's my fault for not being clued up on the basics first um, before trying to point the finger at that surgeon and saying that surgeon did something wrong when it's my fault. Okay. Right. Um, so we'll just say that he does pass the Deuteronomy 13 test. We don't find anything wrong with Paul. Um, right. No, number 30, Paul's doctrines cannot be confirmed by two to three witnesses. Uh, no, David, do you want to talk about this one? I mean, he, he didn't really explain what he meant by that point and, and what I saw. So I, I don't know what he means. So I guess what we can say is that it was confirmed by various witnesses mm -hmm. because all the apostles accepted Paul and right. none of them wrote and told us watch out for this guy because they would have certainly done it. They would have, he was this big persecutor. If Paul right. ended up becoming a false prophet, uh, they would have certainly written about his, uh, the, the dangers associated with following Paul's false teachings, but they never do. Uh, they do the the opposite. They just welcome him and and yeah, all that stuff. Uh, so, okay, number thirty one. James three seems to be directly teaching against Paul personally. Um, uh, David, I know I, I didn't have I, I, Justin didn't explain this one either, so I'm not really sure. Right. Did you have anything yeah. on this? Um. I would just disagree. <laughs> I think that uh, James three doesn't teach against Paul personally. Um, and it, there, he might yeah. have the next the next point kind of gets into some tension between James and Paul, so that might be what he has in mind. But but thirty one, yeah, I'm, I since he didn't okay. explain, I, I so, can't really comment. So let's read the next point. It is that Paul says that works are useless for salvation. And James, one of the 12, says the opposite. Sure. Uh, okay. So the first uh, really big problem here is um, that Justin seems to deny the gospel, the gospel message of salvation by grace through faith. Because right here he says that James, his, his interpretation of James is that works are not useless for salvation that works are required for salvation. That's his uh, interpretation of that, which right. is a contradiction of the gospel message, which is that we are saved by grace through faith, which by the way, is the same gospel message that is affirmed by James and the other apostles in Acts 15. So James mm -hmm. is not teaching that, uh, that, uh, sal that works are, are required for salvation as Justin understands. Um, in, in any case, James, who was not one of the 12 disciples, by the way, um, he, uh, or not one of the 12 apostles, uh, James does not say that salvation comes through works. As I said, um, there's no contradiction. I, I go into much more detail on this in, in my book, When Faith Works. Uh, I have an entire chapter dealing with this issue. But um, the first thing to point out is that James does not deny that we are justified by faith. He doesn't teach us that faith can't save. Uh, he teaches us that counterfeit faith can't save. That's the, mm. the distinction. So James is not against faith alone for salvation. He's against counterfeit faith. He's saying counterfeit faith can't save you. So what is counterfeit faith? It's the kind of faith, as James goes on to explain, which might intellectually affirm certain biblical truths, but it doesn't lead to good works. True saving faith into James and Paul is fully surrendering to Yeshua. It's committing your life to him in not only your words and not only your intellectual beliefs, but in your deeds. It's, uh, you know, it, it's committing to follow him as Luke 9, 23 says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
So James agrees with Paul that we are saved by faith alone, but faith needs to be defined correctly. And that's what James is dealing with. He's giving the correct definition of faith. He's emphasizing that doing good works is the necessary outgrowth of saving faith. Faith that doesn't produce good works is a counterfeit. And that counterfeit faith cannot save you. That's what James is saying. And the second thing that I would add to that is that Paul taught the same thing as James. He said that true saving faith is evidenced by works, that that's the type of faith that justifies us. In Ephesians 2, 8, which is what Justin quoted, uh, Paul says, by grace you have been saved through faith, not as a result of works, right? But when we look at the very next verse, we see that Paul, again, clearly affirms that saving faith will result in good works. This mm. is what he says in Ephesians 2.10. He says, for we are his workman, workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there's no mm. contradiction mm. between James and Paul. Both of them affirm the gospel message, which, we, which is that we are saved by grace through faith in the Messiah, and our saving faith will produce good works. Amen. And that is the good news. <laughs> that Amen. We, because, oh man, when, see, the problem is, is we can easily start thinking that uh, our works of the law um, if we throw out Paul, that's that's really the road we start going to, is our works of the law is going to be uh, what starts justifying us before God. And many people uh, subconsciously, even though they may disagree with, they may not admit it, but they do start uh, acting like they believe that their works um, justifies them because they look down on others because of their works. And so that's, that's often what Paul really is trying to teach us, and which was a very common thing we those certain pharisees who came against yeshua were those kinds of uh, people who were uh, thinking they were justified they were they were so holy because outwardly they were uh, apparently but inwardly they were they weren't and that's what the the core is because you need to be renewed from the inside out and only the blood of messiah can do that for us okay amen uh, number 34 um Paul taught that Messiah didn't come in the flesh, but in the likeness of flesh, a doctrine specifically stated to be an antichrist doctrine, according to 1 John 4. The likeness of man and appearance as a man are how Paul describes the Messiah. Sure. Yeah. Well, basically, Justin wants to believe that Paul taught some sort of Gnosticism because uh, Gnosticism basically denies that Christ came in the flesh. Uh, but, you know, because Paul uses words like appearance as a man and likeness of man. However, um, Justin needs to read the rest of Scripture. Scripture is clear that, that Justin's assertion is false here. Paul does teach that Messiah came in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 says that Messiah was, quote, manifest in the flesh. Paul even tied the Messiah to the people of Israel by race, quote, according to the flesh in Romans 9, 5. And for crying out loud, the entire basis of the gospel message that Paul proclaimed is that Messiah bled and died for our sins, which is only possible if he was fully human. So, mm. which, um, you know, and, and then he rose from the grave. And, and Paul affirms this doctrine in 1 Corinthians 15 when he talks about the revelation, uh, the, the, uh, uh, resurrection to come and all of that, and he affirms the gospel message. So Messiah was fully man and fully God, and, fall, and Paul affirmed that Messiah was fully man, that he did come in the flesh, uh, and which is clear from the examples that I just gave. Mm, well said. I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, mm -hmm. Next one, number 35. And this was, uh, I know for some people, this was one that was uh, quite a... Uh, one that, that there was a lot of confusion about this point. So um, it is that Paul testifies he was kicked out of the Church of Asia. Ephesus was then rewarded in the book of Revelation for kicking out a false apostle. 
Um, well, look, okay, what, what, what Justin is trying to say here is that he believes that Revelation 2 speaks of Paul when it talks about, when it warns um, this church against uh, false apostles because Paul did go to this church um, in uh, Asia and therefore now this must be who Revelation speaks of. But for us to remotely get there, we have to go into reading this already believing he was he is a false apostle and therefore we mm -hmm. can attribute it to him but but there's no other reason to say that revelation 2 speaks of is speaking of paul specifically there are many mm -hmm. false prophets and false apostles who are today here and who were who, there's there's been and they were always will be and no doubt these churches had many of them coming and going and that was probably why they rejected much of the teaching of probably even Paul or the disciples because they may have even inclined their ear towards false apostles instead. So, right. yeah. Anything to add? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the as you said, Justin's just reading into the text uh, what he wants what he wants to be true. He's starting with the assumption that Paul is a false apostle. And so he's reading that into Revelation 2.2. 2. The problem with Justin's assertion is that Paul ministered to believers in Ephesus. There's an entire book called Ephesians. Acts 20, right. 17 through 30 shows that the elders of the church of Ephesus received Paul and they wept when it was time for him to leave. These were the elders of the church of Ephesus. In fact, Revelation 2.2 2 confirms Paul's own warning because uh, Paul uh, said, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Paul said this to the church in Ephesus in Acts 20.29 20, through 30. So Revelation confirms Paul's warning. That the elders in the church of Ephesus, they received him, they, they loved him, they wept when he left, and then Paul warned them that after he leaves, there's going to be false apostles coming to, uh, you know, to, to try to lead you astray. So John in Revelation, he's, he commends the church of Ephesus for essentially heeding Paul's warning. That's what's so twisted about Justin's uh, interpretation here, is that, um, exactly as I just said, that in Revelation, John commends the church of Ephesus for listening to Paul's warning and rejecting false apostles. Um, Justin did bring up uh, 2 Timothy 1.15 when he talks about all who were in Asia turning away from him. And Justin's kind of like, um, you know, proof texting. And he's taking that and saying, oh, well, Paul did all in Asia, reject, turned away. So that must connect to Revelation 2.2, 2, where, you know, the church of Ephesus is commended for rejecting false apostles. Well, first, in context, all uh, does not mean literally all in Asia rejected him. The very next verse says that the household of, I, I can't pronounce that name, but but the household of, of one of Paul's companions, uh, companions that they didn't re uh, reject him. And uh, he's, mm. he's writing to Timothy, who was a leader in the church of Ephesus. So mm. Timothy, the person he's writing this letter to, obviously didn't reject Paul. Um, so what Paul is likely referring to in, in first, uh, 2 Timothy 1.15 is that he was likely referring to his traveling companions in Asia who would not visit him in prison in Rome. That's why in the very next verse, he blesses his one companion um, and, and says, Lord, bless him and give him, him and his household mercy because he searched for him in Rome and found him. So um, another point that I want to bring up on this, and, and it's a, a historical point that I think is very relevant to kind of uh, uh, drive the nail in the coffin here, is that Polycarp, who, who is um, one of the early church fathers, uh, he was a disciple of John, and John wrote Revelation. Well, in Polycarp's uh, epistle to the Philippians, uh, Polycarp has nothing but glowing praise for Paul. He refers to Paul's teachings, and, and he blesses Paul, and, and calls him a beloved brother and all of this. 
don't you think that a disciple of John's would warn and offer concerns about Paul if John indeed considered Paul to be a false apostle? Um, so it, it's just, there's so many problems with this argument. It, it's just- Right. Um, that's a really good point right. that you just brought out right. there. Mm. Mm. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, awesome. No, that was that was a great explanation. Thanks for that, David. Um, so I'm just going to go into the next one right here, um, and this one is also uh, one of the big ones that I know many people are confused about. The one about food sacrifice to idols. So, uh, number thirty six, Paul taught that the eating of food sacrificed to idols, an act condemned in the book of Revelation, um, chapter two. So. Uh, Justin is just saying that Paul is speaking against basically um, both the Torah as well as what is said in Revelation, because in Revelation, God tells us um, that there are many, there, well, he's, he's writing to a church and he says, um, you guys are eating food sacrificed to idols and it's a big problem. Now, the problem is, though, is that's not Paul is not against that commandment in the law of God. He is not saying that. And we're, and we're going to illustrate this to you guys. Um, we need to understand that uh, in the first century, there were f food sacrifice to idols was a big deal because the pagan society of the day was very much. Um, uh, you, you can go to a, a marketplace, and if you just bought food like meat, you wouldn't even know. But that meat could have been sacrificed to an idol. And the problem is, is if there is a new believer with you, right, and they see you buying that meat and you're eating it they're going to stumble because they're going to think you're worshiping a pagan god because that's what is usually done with food sacrificed to idols. So, in fact, in Exodus 34, this is where this commandment comes from initially. Um, we read, For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore off to their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice. Okay, so there is another, um, in Numbers 25 verse 2 also speaks of it. And in both cases, it's always to do with worshiping these other gods. People would worship these other gods and eat food sacrificed to idols in a form of worship to this other god. That is the issue. And Paul mm. is, in, in 1 Corinthians 8, he tells us that we know there's no other gods. We, we know that there's no other idol. There's no such thing as uh, another God in, in real, if, we, if, we're, if we're really thinking about this matter, because we believe in the one true God. So he's saying that the issue if, is not per se just the food in and of itself, because it's just food. Food is food. It, the food doesn't get changed because it gets sacrificed to an idol. And, but the problem is, is that it is when you eat of it, you, it can be seen as worship to another God. If, if, and if it's not your own conscience, it can be that you're seen to be doing that. And that's why it talks about the conscience. Because it is, if we eat food sacrificed to an idol, but we think of this idol, we are worshiping that other God by that. So that's the issue. Right. Paul is not saying you can now eat food sacrificed to idols as long as no one is looking and whatever. No, he, he's not saying that. He's just saying the reason why it's an issue and again, brothers and sisters, that's why Paul is not against the Torah. He's giving more revelation about the Torah commandment and what really would be the actual problem with eating food sacrificed to idols. And then he ends it off uh, in, the, in the end of his letter. And he says, um, if um, uh, now sinning in this way against his brothers and wounding their weak conscience, you sin against Messiah. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never, ever eat meat again, lest I make my brother stumble. He is saying, I will not, even if I shouldn't eat any meat, because I don't know what in that, what's in that marketplace. I don't know what's clean and what's what's sacrificed right. in Ireland, what's not. So I'm just going to rather just play it safe. So in fact, right. Justin says, he's, he's, he's saying we should eat food sacrificed to Ireland. But on the contrary, when we read the chapter, he's saying the opposite. Yep. Yeah. And that, that's what's so twisted about Justin's interpretation is because Paul is literally discouraging the Corinthian believers from eating food offered to idols uh, for the reason that you mentioned is because it could it could cause a massive fallout with with other believers that that, uh, you know, 
they would, you know, have a problem with that and they would stumble over that. So yeah, he's not encouraging it. He's discouraging it and explaining why. Right. So it's, it's a, uh, yeah. Anyway. Right. Yeah. Perfect yeah. explanation, PD. That was very good. Great to go. Um, all right. Number 37. Um, Paul says it's better to not get married like him. Justin says the Torah says otherwise. It is not good for man to be alone. And therefore, Paul is a false apostle because he is, he is teaching something contrary to the Torah. Well, again, and, and, and this, this, again, speaks to this issue that we highlighted at the beginning and other parts through this, this broadcast, is the logical implications of Justin's objections here will lead him to reject the entire New Testament and Messiah himself if, if he's logically consistent in his position. Because based on Justin's logic here, Messiah should also be rejected because in Matthew 19, 10 through 12, Messiah taught that some people are better off not being married. Now, obviously this is the exception to the rule uh, as both Messiah and Paul taught, um, but it, Messiah did say that some people, uh, it, it's better for them not to be married. So, so based on Justin's logic, he'd have to reject Messiah too. But Paul's advice, uh, real quick, in 1 Corinthians 7, again, it was the exception to the rule. He wasn't contradicting Torah. Uh, the reason he gave this advice was, quote, in view of the present distress in, in uh, chapter 7, verse 26 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, because of the troubled times, the present distress uh, that, that they were going through uh, at that time, Paul says it's probably better if, if you didn't marry um, in view of this present distress. So it's not a general rule. He's not forbidding marriage or discouraging it. He is only saying that uh, in view of the present distress, it's better uh, for some not to get married. And he even encourages getting married, um, you know, in that same chapter saying, if you, you know, it's better for you to get married than for you to burn with passion, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so Justin just doesn't have a very nuanced view. He, he's cherry picking little verses out of context rather than reading the whole chapter and seeing the, the whole argument that, that Paul is making. Mm. That's really good. I have nothing to add. Well, well, well said. <laughs> All right. Number 38. Paul's teaching of abstinence above all led to sexual immorality among church leaders for centuries, and it still continues. And basically, Justin is saying here that um, what we see, for example, in the Catholic Church with a lot of sexual immorality, things not even worth mentioning, horrible things, um, is because Paul uh, encouraged, apparently, that we um, should be uh, abstaining from marriage and things like that. So uh, the problem with this idea is, however, that well, we just, David just very well explained that Paul was not against marriage and that it was an exception to the rule. However, uh, we also have another good example that we could use. Um, Paul wrote to Timothy um, in the, the letter of Timothy, and he actually said that forbidding to marry is demonic. Paul said that right. in, in, in himself. So, right. you know, we read, for example, 1 Timothy 4, now the Spirit expressly says in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, teachings of demons, um, through the insincerity of liars whose conscience are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving. Okay, so Paul is saying, hey, I, this is actually a demonic teaching to forbid marriage. Paul did not forbid marriage. He said it's demonic to do so. And so for any church who does so, who says, you know, a, a pastor or a whatever, a priest may not marry, that's contrary to the word of God. And Paul said himself mm -hmm. at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians 7, that chapter that David just uh, spoke about, um, if his passions are strong, talking about the, the person, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry, it is no sin, okay? So right. Paul is not against it. He says it's not a sin. He says it's a sin to forbid it. Um, yeah. So 
Okay, so yeah. I don't know how Justin got here, but yeah, um, I mean, a lot of these brothers and sisters, we have gone through 38 points now. Um, and every single one of them, I think we have adequately shown to be very, very weak points and are not worth, um, not one of them is, a, is even remotely a valid argument to show that Paul is a false apostle. And in fact, as this list goes on, um, it just becomes more and more weak, the points, because I believe Justin was just trying to find points so he can get to that number 50 so he can put it in his video. Um, and really, honestly, if, if Paul was a, let me just say it like this, if Paul was a false apostle, we would only need one point. And that would be mm -hmm. that the other apostles would have said he was. As simple mm -hmm. as that. But they don't. In fact, they do the opposite. But if we were to go and say, no, the other apostles, they, those works, those letters that did encourage, that did say Paul is a good man, that, that Paul is a true apostle, if we, Justin would need to throw out all those letters, all that evidence to make Paul a false apostle. And then he has nothing left. He will have no more New Testament left by the end of it. And this is the big danger, brothers and sisters. It is incredibly dangerous. And what we are speaking of, denying Paul as a false apostle is heresy. And it is to the fullness mm -hmm. of the word heresy. And look, me and David, we have a love for our brother and for everyone who listened and listened to him. This is why we are making this video. This is why we encourage people to test. And we have tested and we've seen every point to be uh, false. And so, therefore, I want to just uh, I want to show everyone just something here uh, very quickly. Um, when we go to uh, Justin's website, okay, and I'm just going to open it up here, and, and we're going to just go to his beliefs, okay. Under who we are, he has a belief statement, and in this statement, this is to date. This is on the 19th of April. Today we are recording this video. This is what we see, and. Um, this belief statement on salvation, on the acts of Yeshua, on sin, on faith, on grace, on identity, etc. Okay, this is his entire belief statement is lettered with scriptures that are Paul's letters. Okay, we have on salvation how he took mm -hmm. from Romans. He took from um, yeah, various from Romans. He took from Ephesians, right? On the acts of Yeshua, he took uh, from also from 1 Corinthians, okay? And the letter, and it goes on. Every On every single point he took from Paul. And the big problem with this is that we will have to ask the question, why is this still here? Because Justin said that he has believed mm -hmm. what he believes for at least a year. And he still, he hasn't right. taken these out yet. He hasn't taken all these scripture references. And if he did take it out, brothers and sisters, let's just ask the question, what would be left on that statement of belief? If we are to take out all of these scriptures, we have to take, we have to, Justin was now forced to call into question basic foundational beliefs, like being saved through, by grace, through faith, instead of works. He has to call into question all of these things that make up the foundation of the faith of Christianity. And he calls his channel the Christian, uh, a Christian channel, right? So we have to ask the question, brothers and sisters, what is, what is the consequences of throwing out these letters? And in our assessment, the consequences is, are going to be incredibly dire um, with regards to it. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, y you know, I, I, I just, well, I, I guess one thing is, is that, you know, neither you nor me, we have any ill will toward Justin as a person. You know, we're the only reason we're doing this is because we deeply care uh, about the people that are affected by this. And uh, the scriptures say that not many should become teachers um, because teachers will be judged more strictly. And, you know, that's, this is what we're doing. You know, we're, we're looking at this teaching. We're, we're uh, um, going through it. We're, we're demonstrating how this teaching is false in literally every way. There's not a single good point here. Um, and it, it's just, um, 
you know, we, we're not doing this because we, you know, like to refute people, you know, this is the last mm -hmm. thing I want to do. The last thing yeah. I want to do is write a big article based on a two hour video, uh, or, or, you know, I, I, I would rather not have to make videos like this or write yeah. articles like I did. Yeah. I would, and you know, so we, we're doing this because we, we love you all. And, uh, and I, I know that PD agrees. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all that I, that I have there. I, I just, I just pray for Justin. I, I pray for his repentance, but I, I plead with you all do not get sucked into, to what he's teaching there because it's, it's just utterly false. Yes. Yeah. And I, I also think that we should just all ask ourselves the question of if one teaching, okay, this is more than one because he's put out a part two now, but um, has so many very serious grave errors, even after Justin admits a year of study, um, how can we trust the other teachings? And I'm not saying that everything Justin has ever put out is, is wrong, but not at all. Um, but as for currently today, when as for a week ago, um, I, I do not assess him to be a teacher that we can trust in listening to, and especially if we're new to the faith, especially if we um, aren't uh, well versed in the scriptures yet. Um, and so I, I will say that I believe if this was the first century that he would be disqualified, the, the, the apostles, the others would have disqualified him from teaching. And I'm sorry, I know this is such a hard word. Um, but it is very important for us to say things like it is. And, and, I, and, I, and I really would like to also echo what David said. And it is that I, when I decide, when I start thinking of doing, we start thinking of doing this, my heart was greatly troubled. I didn't want to do this. In fact, I, I hoped someone else would instead pick it up at some point because I, I truly dislike it, doing it myself. But some things are necessary and this was necessary. Um, just for the edification of the body. So um, we're just, I just want to end this off in a prayer. I, I would just like to pray for Justin. Pray for um, everyone who's listening to this and who has listened to his teachings. And we pray for, we also like to pray just for discernment in the body um, as a whole regarding things like this, because this will not be the last time. We will hear of many such teachings come forth into the future as well, unfortunately. So, Father, Lord, we just pray, uh, Yeshua, God, we just thank you for your scriptures, that you have been able to give us a word that is whole, a word that does not lack, because, Lord, that is what you have left us with. That is what we can stand on. That is how we know what you have said is what you have said and that it is true. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word is truth and will forever be truth, including the words of Paul. And so, Father, we just pray for, I just pray firstly for Justin. Father, I pray for your mercy, grace to envelop him, but Father, to lead him to your truth, to open his eyes, Lord, to what he has been teaching. And Lord, I pray for all who watch and listen to be able to have open ears and hearts to see the truth. And Father, I just pray, Lord, for discernment within the body, supernatural discernment, to be able to tell truth from a lie, Lord, and for us to not be have favoritism, Father, to the over teachers to the point where we choose a teacher over the truth of Your Word. So, Father, we just thank You for Your sacrifice and that we are saved by faith. In the name of Yeshua, Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, uh, we hope that this teaching has blessed you. We thank you for bearing with us. Um, in this one and I just want to leave you with this scripture again um, that I have said in the beginning uh, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37 if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord and if anyone does not recognize this he is not recognized all right mm -hmm. so brothers sisters blessings and shalom thank you for tuning in